Hey guys, Brian Jodis here for Pick Up The Six Podcast. We've got a great show coming up, but before that, encouraging you to go check out the new gear we have over at PickUpTheSix.com. Head over to the website, click the gear tab, and there's three new shirts on there that I'm pretty fired up about. I'm wearing one of them right now. First one, Quell the Storm and Ride the Thunder. Maybe you know the beginning of that quote. It's from the man in the arena from Teddy Roosevelt, but towards the end, he brings that heat. So go check it out. It's a great line and a great mindset as well. We also have Burn the Boats. And for my faith-driven friends, leave the 99. You'll know what that one means. Plus, we've got t-shirts, hooded sweatshirts, all that good stuff. It's over at pickupthesix.com. Click the gear tab. Help us out. Put a little support our way and keep a little wind in this pirate ship in our sails. Appreciate you. The 100th Bomb Group was heavily involved in some of the deadliest missions of World War II and some of the bloodiest military campaigns in aviation history. There for 25 missions as a B-17 Flying Fortress pilot was John Lucky Luckadoo. The new book, authored by Kevin Maurer, is called Damn Lucky, One Man's Courage During the Bloodliest Military Campaign in Aviation History. Kevin joins us on this episode of Pick Up the Six Podcast. We've got tales of incredible bravery and, yes, a little bit of luck along the way. This is Pick Up the Six Podcast. Kevin, my friend, uh, good to see you. Good to hear from you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. It is April the 19th. New book out today. Damn lucky. About a man that statistically shouldn't have made it through half of these missions. So I know it's an exciting day for you, man. So first of all, congratulations. Best of luck as things get rolling here. Thanks. I mean, this one's been a long time coming. I mean, uh, I got it right before COVID. And mm. then, uh, you know, really it became a project that I did over the COVID the COVID pandemic. And, and I think for some way it was like my survival, right. Yeah, In that, you know, we were all sort of dealing with that whole craziness of COVID and uh, the fact that I had this every day to call lucky. And we, we sort of had kind of walled off an hour a day to, to dig into this. I think it was a kind of a sanity check every day. In, in going through this process, and we're going to get to know him, talk a little mm -hmm. bit about the book, get people excited for it. It's out today. So you guys can pick it up. Um, would you typically want to do interviews when you're writing something of this magnitude? Would you prefer to have done those in person to see that person, to eyeball them, to get to talk to them? And then I, my guess is you get this project being the pandemic, like, well, that's out the window. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, I was slated to fly down to Dallas and sit down with him. And I thought I could do the bulk. I, I was going to pick a weekend. I thought I could get the bulk of what I needed in that weekend, really do it intensive and then come mm -hmm. back and nickel and dime the, the details. Get all the other stuff you didn't maybe right. get while you sat down with him. Um, and then build that rapport so that when I did call for the details, he knew me and it was good. Um, but I, you know, the, the pandemic hit, everything was shutting down and, uh, and I just didn't want to come down there. Like I told him, I said, look, I can't come down there with a good conscience. Uh, and if I can track COVID on the way down, you know, you live in a retirement home. Like, Bro, the I guy survived 25 missions during freaking World War II. The last thing you want to do is take him out. Right. I don't want to be the guy right. that kills the guy. Right. Oh my so, gosh. No kidding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So but you had to pivot quickly, I guess. We pivoted and, and, and honestly, we did it via phone. Mm. So I never really, I, I knew what he looked like based on pictures. Um, I think he Googled me, he kind of probably knew what I looked like, but yeah. we really met on the phone and, and I didn't meet him until a year later uh, that summer when I went down to Dallas and just hung out with him. Um, and that was weird because we knew each other so well at that point, we'd never been in the same room together. <laughs> yeah, so What was weird. that experience like in the finally eyeball him after all that? It was like, a, it was like an old friend. It's like a guy you, you knew for a long time that you hadn't seen in a while. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was it was weird, but it didn't take long, and yeah. it didn't take yeah. long for us to fall right into what we've been chatting about anyway. So, so introduce us to this guy before we talk about these incredible missions and and, and recant just boy acts of heroism and and really a lot of luck. Who's John Luckadoo? He's just an ordinary guy, honestly. I mean, that's what makes it so extraordinary. One, he's an ordinary guy with, with like the best name ever. If I invented so John Lucky Luckadoo, you'd think oh. all right, you went a little too far on your name, right? Right. Um, he's just a, a, a guy in Tennessee who just wanted to serve, you know, he, before the, before the United States gets in the war, he, he tries to go and join the Royal Canadian Air Force because he knows he's kind of got a hunch that this is going to get bigger and wants to serve, wants to fight. Uh, it's got a little adventure and I've got a little of that, uh, kind of frontier American is going to hack his way and find his way. Yeah. Um, a little cockeyed optimism. Mm -hmm. Got a little Absolutely. Billy Mumphrey in him for our Seinfeld. <laughs> yeah. 
That's a good one. Yeah, I'm going to steal that. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that's who he is. And, and that's yeah. what I think makes the story so human is that he's not, you know, I've written, I've written stories about special operations guys and those guys are wired a special way, right? Yeah. They're, they're, that's, they're not, they have, they have to be to compartmentalize what they're asked to do in those mm-hmm. moments, I think. Right. Lucky's not. Lucky's mm-hmm. just a regular guy, wanted to be a pilot, answered the call after Pearl Harbor and learns on the job against probably, a, you know, the Luftwaffe in 43, which is they're lethal at this point. And yeah. so, I mean, that's what makes the story, I think, so accessible for everybody is that, you know, he's kind of a regular guy in an extraordinary situation and rose to the occasion and answered the bell. I think, you know, we throw around, not lightly, I mean, it's a term we've dubbed them with as the greatest generation. And I think a large part of it is because of those stories of coming out of the woodworks, just coming out of everyday life and sort of regular guys like this John Luckadoo, who, like you said, just a kid from Tennessee who feels so called. He's literally like, I'm going to go join the, the Royal Air Force because mm-hmm. there wasn't an option for him yet finds a way there. I think we call them that because they had to do some extraordinary things through horrendous battle and combat <laughs> like we'd never seen before. But they also just sort of stepped up in everyday moments. Did you get us? I mean, when you started talking to him, it seems to me like it was pretty clear. He's super humble about it, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And just like a regular guy. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I've, I've done two books now in World War II and interviewing World War II veterans. Are, it's different right? Because we grew up in a time of movies and TV. So when you ask a, a modern veteran, like, hey, so that time, what happened? He'll give you the gr- a great story and he'll tell you what he was smelling and what it looked yeah. like. And it, it's real cinematic. Lucky doesn't tell stories that way. He tells them very matter of fact, got in the plane. Here's what I had to do. Did it. Came back. Right. And yeah. so it took us a long time and it took me a long time to kind of, all right, go back now. What did it smell like? What to get him to-, to. Yeah. To, to kind of give me the texture. Right. But I think part of that, too, is that he didn't for 50 years, he didn't talk about it. Mm. So for him, this wasn't a story. This wasn't a story to him. This was something he experienced and then processed and had put away. And now I was dragging it out of him. So what happened actually about six weeks into the into the process, he had to take a break. Yeah. And we had talked about it. I said, look, when we get into this, this is I'm going to drag some things out of you. And, and you're going to. Ha- and he, so he had to stop and process a little bit more of it because he was re- sort of reliving it again. Mm. But, uh, but for these guys, I mean, I think that they, and what I like about this book too, is Lucky doesn't shy away from the trauma of what he endured and he doesn't gloss over coming back. And, and, and there's a whole, the whole last section of the book really deals with, all right, he's done the 25 missions. He should be dead. He knows it. A lot of his friends are dead and he comes back and how he deals with that trauma, I think is as important as the heroism you see in oh, the beginning. Man. Oh man, that, that is what has me, I think, fired up for folks to get this book in hand for a few reasons, right? Like it, it's simple math to know that we don't have a lot of those guys left. Mm-hmm. The, you know, when you see an honor flight going through the airport uh, and when they were really going a lot pre-pandemic, boy, it's just, it's, it's all inspiring to see those guys. And there's just not a lot of them left to, to, to go back in, in the depth in which he had to probably go. I think it's understandable. You know, one of the things we often say here, and we've talked to a lot of folks who've done incredible things on behalf of our nation, and specifically guys like Lucky, uh, Vietnam veterans who endured some real hardships, and then Gold Star families. We don't take for granted what it takes to have to go in and do that. I'm getting a sense you you probably felt that a little bit with him through the process of, of having to dig back into this. I mean, it's some of the bloodiest military campaigns in aviation history. And it's easy, it's easy enough, right? Air quotes for me to read mm-hmm. that, but for him to have to relive that and tell that to you, so you can put it down on paper. That's quite a process. I would think. Yeah. I mean, and I, and I think, you know, while I agree that the, the greatest generation is probably a good title for them, I think sometimes that puts them on a pedestal mm-hmm. and we forget that they're human beings and they had to do some extraordinary things and they went through some extraordinary stuff. I mean, I, I wrote a book about Corregidor too. And, you know, what happened on that island was was unbelievable. So um, I think what I think the courage that Lucky shows in this book, not only in what he did, but also in, in opening up like he does and, and kind of exposing a little bit of like, this is who I was when I left. And then this is who I was when I got back. And it, it colored, you know, my whole life and the, what I did and the choices I've made, you know, when I returned to the United States, all are, are predicated on what I endured and, and what I sacrificed to get there. Okay, we're going to learn a little bit more about this 100th bomb group, 
right? The things they went through. Kevin, mm-hmm. for you to, to go through those experiences personally, how much do you gain from that process? And how much of that stays with you for weeks, months, years, forever? I think all of it. I mean, especially when I, when I, and I've written, I've written books for veterans where I've had to write it in the first person and that, mm, that you yeah. I end up stealing lingo from them or I steal, you know, some of their, um, some of the, the their phrasing. Sure. Um, so, so all of it is sort of echoes. Um, but for lucky, I, I just think, I think the thing I most take away from lucky is just how genuine he is and mm. how uh, he's just a, he's just a good guy. Right. You know, I don't know how to, another way to put it. It's just, he he's sound, just a, I mean, again, you read his name on paper. Like, it sounds like a good guy. Yeah. He's just a good dude who, who doesn't seem like um, he's too wrapped up in himself or mm-hmm. any of this. I just feel like he's a guy who served and then came back and built a life uh, and, you know, is content and happy with all of it. And, uh, and I, I, I kind of want to be that, He's calm too. That's the other thing. When you see him in person, yeah, he's good, yeah. he's real calm. And I, I kind of would love to mirror that more, um, that kind of energy, because there's a calmingness to it too. I don't know. That's what I take most about away from Lucky. 25 missions in a B-17 in hostile territory. Mm-hmm. That calmness uh, yeah. likely served him well. Maybe it kept him in the fight. There is something pretty incredible about that generation, what they were thrust to do in, that, in those moments uh, when faced with uh, terrible evils across the globe uh, and then came back into their communities and, and built communities. Yeah. Uh, you know, I grabbed this, this is sitting right on my desk. I keep drinks on it. It's a coaster. My grandfather was the chief of police in new Milford, New Jersey was on the USS Terry in world war II. Uh Naval uh, destroyer was out in the Pacific during the battle of Iwo Jima served his country there, came back, became a cop, built a community, became right. chief of police, right? This is what they did. Mm-hmm. This is what they did, man. Yeah. But to your point, right. They probably had to put some, <laughs> Now I got to put some of that stuff away and maybe yeah. not talk about it for a long, long time. So I'm excited about folks to get their hands on damn lucky, the new book that is out today to hear his story, but then also think about the legacy, right? And the legacy that he's leaving behind and, and, and his ability to have to come back years later and process that. All right. So tell me a little bit about, right. Kid from Tennessee looking for ways in finally gets an Avenue there ends up in the hundredth bomb group, which is part of this eighth air force. So who are these guys, right? Who, who's making this thing up? I mean, the hundredth bomb was kind of an interesting bomb, right? The bloody hundredth is what they end up getting because of the losses. Um, they, when he, when Lucky gets there, they were are sort of down on their luck. They, they sort of me- they messed up their training mission. They were supposed to deploy earlier. They, they, they screwed up the, the the final check, so they had to get recycled. And they, the whole bomb group lost all of their co- co-pilots. So when Lucky graduates from multi-engine school, he gets sent straight to the 100th bomb group and to replace these pilots that they cycled up because the, the group had trained for so long that the co-pilots had as many hours as the lead pilots. Mm. And in some squadrons, they were they had more hours than the lead pilots in some squadrons. So they moved these co-pilots out to be lead pilots, I guess, and they moved Lucky's guys in. And so Lucky and his 43 classmates arrive at the 100th bomb group and have to learn how to be co-pilots on the, on the job. They've never flown a B-17. They've never been in. Dude, they never. This, this is what's so wild to me. Like they're yeah. literally learning it as they go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He'd never flown a plane with more than two engines. Jeez. Ever. B-17. Big dog. Now he's in a B-17 with Big four. Yeah. Right. Um, and he's second in command of a 10-man crew. Wow. And so when he gets there, the crew he's on, led by Glenn Dye, they don't like him. One, they really like the co-pilot. And two, he's a jinx, right? They're getting ready to deploy. And this new guy doesn't know anything. New guy comes and, walking in. Yeah. And so I think the, the, you know, he ends up enduring probably some, some pretty terrible hazing and he has to really police his, 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 his six a little bit as he's preparing to then learn how to do his job and go overseas. Uh, but, and, and this is the thing about uh, lucky story is, is it's got such great novelistic moments where he, he eventually, and if, if I made this up, it would it'd be too convenient. He eventually is is thrust into a position where it's it's up to him to get the crew over to to England, and that's where I think he earns his mm. his his bones at, at that point. And that's when he becomes part of the crew. And then once they get there, Glenn Die is determined to get in and out of this mission, and so he he volunteers for everything. He gets that crew rolling, and they end up uh, not having any time at that point. It's like they're just churning. And so, but I think the moment where where Lucky proves himself. Um, is when he actually flies them to England. And that's a that's a pivotal moment in his story. And they're like, all right, this guy's legit. 
And yep. there's trust that it, they're earning trust yep. along the way. You're, you're throwing into that bucket of respect, right? You keep filling that bucket up. And oftentimes it takes action, not words. Seems like it took this action from him. Yeah. Uh, they know this group, meaning they, the other guys, the bad guys, yep. right? The, they know about this group. They're on the radar. Access Sally mm-hmm. knows them by name. What does she say to them? What, what, what's their perception, right? They've got a reputation. What do they know about? Well, this is my favorite part because she calls them out by name. She's like, she tells them this isn't their war and that they don't have any business being over there. And my favorite part is when she says your girlfriends and wives are being romance back in the States. I love that line. Well, she's trying to break them down. I love that line. Uh, but she, and she ends it with like, but as long as you're here, we're going to teach you a lesson. And, and I think, you know, Lucky was big on this, this aspect of it where he said, you know, they did teach them a lesson because at this point, the Luftwaffe, you know, had been at war since 1939. They'd fought the Russians. They'd fought the British in the Battle of Britain. This was a seasoned, you know, seasoned force that they were fighting. And, and, and Lucky was still learning how to fly a B-17. So you take American crews that have no combat experience. And, and we, one of the things I, I asked him initially, I said, on that first mission, did you go around the base and talk to people about what they'd seen? And he said, no, because we hadn't seen anything yet. So they take off and have no idea. Nobody right. can say, hey, this is what you need to think about up there. Mm-mm. They all learned it on the fly. So then if they're out um, experienced, so to speak, right? Maybe we're not outmanned or outgunned or anything. We might be able to match up with them plane for plane. I don't know, but they're out experienced. If statistically, they, they'd be lucky if you made it through 10 missions, let alone 25. What What ends up being the difference for them? What is it that puts us over the hump? Honestly, it was a it was a nation that rallied around a cause, and we man, we could out manufacture them. So th- the Germans, when they would lose a pilot, it was harder for them to replace that pilot because they were under constant pressure day and night of, of, of bombing. Mm-hmm. They're fighting a war, um, and they didn't they couldn't replace pilots or equipment as fast. Americans, we could mass produce. We I think the the the, the B seventeen G, which comes in comes into production because to to answer some of the Luftwaffe tactics tactics it they produce 8000 of those by the end of the war i mean americans were producing planes faster than the germans could shoot them down and we were training crews faster than we could shoot them down because they were in in the united states they were safe and then you could get them over there yeah but on the flip side of that coin is if you're one of those crews or you're flying those missions you're a guinea pig and it, and they really were lucky in his 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 men and his crews were guinea pigs in a in an experiment to see if precision air bombing would work during daylight, and and that's really the sin of it. Mm. I mean, they lost more guys than the U.S. Marine Corps in World War II. The Eighth Air Force was like you get it get assigned to the Eighth Air Force, it's a fear. You're not coming home. Yeah. yeah, it's and they knew it climbing in. I mean, the hardest part of the missions, to some extent, was getting into the aircraft after after you've seen what you're facing. Yeah, but you said something in there. They they rallied around the cause. Mm-hmm. that was bigger. That's pretty incredible. Um, without giving away all the right great moments, tell me about this guy. I mean, there must be multiple moments, but give me one good one where he's, where really lucky <laughs> comes into play where they're like, that shouldn't have gone that way. So the, the book, really the crux of the narrative is on one mission. It was October 8th, 1943 over Bremen. Mm-hmm. And that's the one mission where he, he thought he was going to die. And, and so we really slow everything down and tell that mission in detail. But, but yeah. one of the things he carries with him every time he goes on a mission, he's got a Bible that he wears in his breast pocket that was creased by shrapnel. It, it, the shrapnel slowed just enough where it hit him and creased the Bible, but didn't kill him. It should have killed him. And so he has this Bible in his pocket after that, and he carries it all the time. And so, I mean, that's this kind of thing like, these guys, it wasn't a matter, like you'll talk to modern veterans and they'll have gone on millions of patrols, right? But maybe they've, they've done tons of patrols and never saw the enemy. It wasn't a matter of if they were going to see the Luftwaffe, it was when and how bad was it going to be? And so every time they went, they were in harm's way. Does he still own that? Oh, yeah, he does. Yeah, he yeah. does. Yeah. Man, that's, I'm almost at a loss for words, Kevin, to be honest with you. Like, I'm just kind of taking it all in. I can't wait to get my hands on this thing and, and dig through this book and, and, and lean into those moments uh, and think about what they've, uh, what, they've been, uh, what they've been through, what he went through, um, and just that incredible man, tenacity, right, to kind of stick with it, especially when you climb into the cockpit. I mean, odds are you're not coming back out of that. 
I mean, you've heard modern modern um, veterans talk about this too. You know, they don't fight for the cause; they they fight for one another. And and I don't think that could be more true than a, than a bomber crew, right? Because yeah. you're you're twenty five thousand feet above the earth. You are probably the most hostile battlefield in the whole war. You're relying on a on an antiquated B seventeen at this point, right? Because it was built in the mid thirties. By the end of the war, it's obsolete, right? It's not pressurized, so you're, it's ne- negative forty or sixty degrees. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't breathe. Because you need oxygen, right? You can't touch anything without a gloved hand or it's going to stick. Yep. Uh, you can't fly, right? So if you get shot down, you're dead. And the plane has to get you there. And you and all of your friends on the other plane. So it's 10 person per, per aircraft. You're all relying on one another to get through. And if one guy doesn't do his job, yep. the whole thing's going down. Let's tell me a little bit before we wrap it up about sort of the, the aftermath, right? And his mm. ability to have to compartmentalize a lot of that for most of his life, build his life, build his family, work in his community to peel it back. What did you, what did you see out of him? What did you feel out of him as he was digging back into that? It's interesting. I, I, I must've asked him this question a bunch of times, but I wanted to hear about what did he do when he wasn't flying missions? What yeah. do you do when you're not yeah. working? And he, he just said, I read and I went to the officer's club. He said, but that's it. And, and I, so I said, well, what, who were your friends? Who did you hang out with? Tell me about some of those guys. And towards the end, he didn't. He kept everybody at arm's length because it was just too painful, right? It was too mm-hmm. hard. And especially, he is, it, there's, a, there's a thread that runs through this that I, I didn't anticipate, which is his buddy, Sully Sullivan, who they both decided they wanted to go to the Royal Canadian Air Force, but only Sully goes. And Lucky ends up running into him when they're both in England together. Supposedly. Oh, really? They didn't? Did yeah. They- they didn't know they were going to see each other. They just Mm-mm. randomly ran into each other. Yeah. Sully leaves. And then about a year later, Pearl Harbor happens and then Lucky gets in. And so they bump into each other and, and Sully comes to visit Lucky and Lucky goes to visit Sully in London. And they, they do a night in London, which is probably my favorite chapter. Cause it's just, it just sounds fun. And it's uh-huh. two guys just kind of running through London. Uh-huh. But um, what struck me about it though, is that, you know, what happens to Sully never, he never shakes that. And, what, and when he comes home, he has to deal with what happened to Sully. And Sully becomes really important because most of the guys, you know, you, you'd, you'd, you'd get it, be in a full, full mess hall, right? A full defect. And you'd fly that day and you'd come back and all you know, be one or two tables of guys. And that's it. Everybody else is gone. Either they're prisoners or they're dead. But there was never any closure. And I think that's the hardest part for Lucky is that he said, you know, we, we never knew what happened. And we hoped that sooner or later they'd pop up on the POW list. But you know, if they, sometimes they didn't. And so dealing with that idea of, of here a minute, gone the next, I think it forced him to push people away. And so he just didn't have strong bonds, particularly outside of his crew. And then when his crew gets done before he does, when they go home, he's sort of kind of a lead pilot that floats around. Then he becomes the operations officer. And then he kind of floats from mission to mission, but he doesn't have that sort, sort of strong organic unit that he can bond with. And so that just pushes him farther to the edge, I think. So he has to process a lot of this on his own. He doesn't have a, a co-pilot or a crewman that, or that to hang with. He doesn't have a gang to hang with. So I think that also, I think, changes the way he mentally handled some of it too. What's he end up doing? You might've said this before, but what's he end up doing when he comes back? Once, once that's all said and done, what's the rest of his life look like? He comes back and then he wants to be an Air Force officer, but realizes that if he stays in the Air Force, there's probably a good chance he's never going to go to college. And he left... Mm-hmm the University of Chattanooga to go to war and he wants to get his degree. So he ends up resigning his commission. He had a chance to go to Stanford, but because of some bureaucratic stuff with the Air Force, he doesn't get to Stanford, but he Hmm. goes to the University of Denver and he gets done with that and he becomes a developer down in Texas. And he he just literally builds communities. It's crazy, man. The way that just life, the path comes before you. This kid from Tennessee ends up going to the University of Denver and then so life after that. It's amazing. Name of the book is Damn Lucky, One Man's Courage During the Bloodiest Military Campaign in Aviation History. His name is Kevin Maurer. He's the author of the book and uh, got a chance to just get to know and and build a, a real friendship and a bond with John Lucky Luckadoo, who is part of 25 missions in the B-17 and through some of the toughest battles when folks read this thing and uh, guys, it's out today, right? Uh, just came out today. Uh, so you can go pick it up. What do you hope they their ultimate takeaway is from it? I mean, honestly, let's start with the, the easy part. I mean, I hope they're entertained. 
I hope it's a story that they want to, to they want to read and they'll remember. Um, and then I hope they take away just about the decency that Lucky, the the price of service, and that idea. But one of the things we we talk about a lot in the book is is he stuck right. Embrace that suck. You got to embrace yeah. the fact that you're there. You're not getting out, so you got to do the best you can. And then I think I, I, the last part is you know we don't have to debate the political landscape, but it's it's divided. It's tough, right? It's it's a it's a mm-hmm. tough conversation to have even with your best friends, right? But during that book and, and during that time, like the United States was united on one thing. We didn't agree with like, everybody, but we were united on one goal and we, on one set of facts. And I think that's the other thing is, is maybe that's behind the scenes, but just, don't, you know, you can't dismiss the fact that the losses were horrific and yet people were rallied around. They knew that the end state was worth the, worth the sacrifice. And I think that's something else. We, we need to embrace that because when we look at our own country, it's not like we can't do it because we've done it, Right. We just have to do it again. Yeah. That's a great point, man. That is a great, great point. Uh, and we were united for a common goal. You wonder, can we do that again? I think we can if we had to. If we had to. Uh, Why did I you? Think, I think we can. Uh, Kevin, man, this has been awesome, man. Thanks for sharing so much about his story. Thanks so much for sharing about your story, too, and, and how it all kind of interweaves. And I know it's something you'll carry with you for a long time. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, so he's Kevin Maurer. He's the author of the new book, Damn Lucky, out today. One man's courage during the bloodiest military campaign in aviation history. The story of John Lucky Luckadoo. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks. He's Kevin Maurer. I'm Brian Jodas. That's been this episode of Pick Up the Six Podcast.